So hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to the book of Matthew. We're going to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 this morning, uh, as we're going to continue in a series that we started last week, and we'll be going through from now until Easter. And the series is called Meet Jesus, Discovering the Nature of God. So if you weren't here last week, let me catch you up just a little bit. So if you are a follower of Jesus for a day, or for 10 years, or for 50 years, one of the, the challenges that we have is that as we get to know Jesus, sometimes the longer we do and we understand who he is, we have a relationship with him and from the scriptures, over time, what starts to happen is that some of the things that we understood about who he was start to change and morph and adjust. And before we know it, sometimes we can end up creating Jesus in our image. And so we have to constantly go back to the Bible to Jesus' own words, to his life, and let him again define for us who he is, and because he's God, who God is. And so last week, if you were here, we talked about how Jesus is a friend of sinners, which is hard for us to get our mind around that the God of the universe could be close to and love and care and have compassion for broken people like all of us. And so this week, we're going we're gonna to shift, and we're going to talk about Jesus being the God of humanity. So, because we believe this, this truth from the Bible, that God is not part God. I mean, Jesus is not part God, part man. He's fully God, and he's fully man, which don't try to understand it. You will blow your mind, okay? It's part of our faith in trusting who God is. So with that, one of the challenges that we face is that we always default to this reality. Jesus can't really relate to me because he was God. So when we read through the scriptures and we read through the stories in the New Testament, we kind of just log that in our brain. And so it's like, yeah, you know, but Jesus was perfect because he was God. So he doesn't really understand what I'm going through because I'm human. Anybody ever thought that or said that? But he's fully God and fully man. He's fully human, which means that Jesus has the capacity to fully appreciate the human condition that you and I live in every single day. He's not immune from it. He's not distant from it. He's not disconnected. He actually understands it. And that's what we're going to talk about today is letting him define his, uh, his own journey, his experience, and how we understand the way he relates to us today. And so I'm going to, to in a moment, I'm going to read a couple passages of scripture. But we did this last week, and I, I think we're going to continue to do it. There's an assumption we make when we gather on Sunday morning, and we open the Bible, and we read it, and we talk about it, and we teach. And that is this. This is the word of God that God speaks through by his Holy Spirit so that we can hear and our lives can be changed. Can we agree to that? So what we're doing right now in the next few moments is not just a physical reality. It's not just some teaching or knowledge-based reality. It is the Spirit of God at work in people to help us understand what the Bible says, what God's speaking to us, so that when we leave this place, we live differently. So we're going to pray that our hearts would be open. The issue is never on God's part, right? The issue is our ears are not open. Our hearts are not attentive. So let's get ourselves in that position. Can we do that? So Lord Jesus, this morning as we look at your journey— that, Lord, that the example you have set for us of what it is to be human, how it is to navigate temptation and challenges in being human, Lord, would you open our ears, would you soften our hearts so that what you are saying today by your Holy Spirit, who's working in us today, we would hear and we would obey and we would live lives that are different because we had encountered you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I want to start with just a couple of passages of Scripture that, that the writer of Hebrews wants to remind a group of people that Jesus does understand right where they live. So maybe these are familiar, maybe not, but in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says this, talking of Jesus, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. So let that sink in. Then going on in chapter 4 of, of Hebrews, verse 15, goes on describing Jesus as a high priest, says this, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. So he understands what it is to be tempted. He understands what it is to be human. And that's why we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, because this is the story we call the temptation of Jesus. This is when Jesus is tempted by the enemy in a number of different areas. And as we look at his journey and we read his story, there are so many things that we can draw about how we navigate temptation, how we can rely on Jesus to help us in our humanity. So go ahead, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And let me read chapter 4, verse 1 uh, to verse 11 of Matthew. So it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, obviously, right? And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. 
But then he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So in this passage, there's some things that help us to understand that Jesus knows what we walk through. Jesus experienced temptation just as we experienced temptation, which means that God of the universe knows you so well, so personally, that when you're going through difficult battles in your life and you're being tempted to do things you know you shouldn't do, he's present because he knows what you're feeling, he knows what you're thinking, he knows what you're walking through. So how do we know that? Four things I wanna highlight how Jesus understands our struggle. So first of all, Jesus understands our struggles with identity, of understanding who we are. So in verses three and verse six, the, the enemy starts his temptation with this phrase, if you are the son of God. Now, let's just think about this for a moment. Did the devil really know that Jesus was the son of God? Yeah, he did. But he's wanting Jesus to either, he's either questioning Jesus to get him to over respond or questioning Jesus to somehow get Jesus to question himself. Remember, he's fully God and he's fully man. So he's trying to get Jesus to kind of question who he is. Because if he can get Jesus to question who he is, then Jesus won't be able to accomplish what he came to do. Because he's going to do it out of who he is. And think about it in our own life. Have you ever gone through a season where you feel like you don't know who you are? You feel like you're lost. You feel like the world's upside down and you're, you're struggling to kind of get your bearings and you, you don't really know, you don't understand and you're trying to understand yourself and you don't really have a good idea of who you are. So therefore you end up making terrible decisions in life. We all do it. But what if you, every single day of your life, could walk in a confidence that you know who you are because it's true of what God has said you are, and you walk in that, and so when you make decisions, when you are tempted, you don't give in to the temptation because you know that who you are is more important than what you do. What if you and I could live our lives every day like that? Do you know we're supposed to live that way every day? We're supposed to actually know who we are? That when the enemy comes and starts questioning who we are, we know the difference between the truth and a lie? We're supposed to live that way. In fact, I'm so convinced that that's true, that you and I have the ability from the scriptures, to the way God speaks, from the way he's wired each one of us, to have a clear understanding of who we are and walk in that confidence every single day. Do you really know who you are? I would say for me, I do know who I am. Do I live that out every day? Probably not successfully, but I know who I am. So those of you taking Catalyst and those of you in Catalyst, one of the core things in the middle of, of the j Catalyst journey is you, you walk through a season where you understand your unique identity, you understand your primary identity, you understand your spiritual gift, and you understand your personality. And you, when you put those things together, you write out what we call is an identity reveal statement, which is not just a paragraph that you read and write and then you stick it away in some drawer and don't pay attention to it. You go back to it over and over again, especially in the moment of temptation when you're feeling like you want to give in to something you know you shouldn't give in to. You go back to what? Who am I? How am I supposed to live my life? When you're facing major decisions in your life and God, should I do this or shouldn't I do this or should I go this way or should I go that way? If you know who you are, you'll know what to do. But if you don't, you won't. So let me just be personal. Those of you who've gone through this, you've already heard, seen this, because this is, my, this is my identity reveal statement. This is the statement I go back to and remind myself when I forget who I am and I'm reminded of who God says I am. My name is John Ampsitz. I'm a child of God and a member of God's family. God says that I am adequate for any situation he calls me to, and he is not disappointed, but is actually well-pleased and takes pleasure in me. He has gifted me to pastor people by guiding them to know and live like Jesus, to teach others by clearly explaining and applying God's word so that others become more like Jesus, and to prophetically reveal the truth of God so others gain understanding, walk in repentance, and receive encouragement. God has designed me to be a person who is loyal, disciplined, dependable, and hardworking, who enjoys being a part of something bigger than myself and is fulfilled by making a difference in the world. That's a journey to get to that point. But I go back to that, and I go back to that, and I go back to that. I know what to say yes to. I know what to say no to. I know how to, how to f navigate the temptation that comes in the form of a lie from the enemy that says, this is not true of me. 
Do you know yourself? This is not just a plug for Catalyst, but that's part of the journey of Catalyst. You know God and you know yourself. It'll change the way you live your life, which leads to the second thing. Jesus also understands our struggle with self-control. None of us ever struggle with self-control, I know. So Jesus is tempted after what? Fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. It says what? He was hungry. So what is the first thing that the enemy does? He comes to Jesus and he says, hey, why don't you just use your abilities? He knows he's the son of God. Why don't you just make something that is not food into food because you know you're really hungry. You could take care of yourself. What did Jesus do? Well, because if Jesus used the ability as God to do something for himself, he would forfeit what he was going to do, which he didn't come for himself. He came for us. And so because of that, he's tempted in his own ability to say, you know what, I could do this, but his self-control kept him from doing something that wasn't going to benefit the people around him. Now think about in our life, self-control. If all of us can agree at one time or another, there's things that we struggle to kind of police ourselves on, things that we struggle to say no to, things that we struggle in self-control. Can you think maybe of one or two or 10 or 100 that we all deal with, right? Let me just, we'll just keep it in the vein of food. So I'll tell you, here's, here's, here's one of my downfalls, okay? You're gonna think this is really silly, but take a picture on the screen. Butter horns from Sven Hartz, okay? These are like the cheapest pastry you can buy at the store. They're like not high-end at all. They are low-end. I don't even know what goes in them, but they're, they taste really good. Maybe there's crack cocaine. I don't know what. There's something in there. Because I don't buy them for myself, but Kim, out of like, just out of her love for me, she'll buy for them for me. And I'm, I'm just confession time, okay? Normally, they come eight in a pack. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'll have one, maybe two for breakfast each, and that'll last at least four or five days. This is what I'm thinking. And then within the first 36 hours, they're all gone. Anybody relate? Because you, know, you have one or two for breakfast, like, well, you know, and I get home in the evening, we had dinner, like, well, it's kind of a dessert. I'll have one and maybe two, and then before you know it, they're gone. I'm like, what? how did that happen? Because there's no limit, there's no barrier, there's no stopping point for me. Why? Because I'm just seeing indulge. Now, I know that's really simplistic. There's a lot bigger things. Maybe, maybe your temptations are in these areas of substances or sex or, or needing approval from other people. And so you get yourself into situations that you shouldn't be in. And maybe it is for the, but you just know that those, that's your downfall. That's the one thing that, you know, and you know the enemy keeps going right at that because he knows that that's the challenge that you have. That's when you and I turn to Jesus because Jesus knows exactly what we feel. I have never fasted 40 days and 40 nights and then pres be presented with a butter horn, okay? Because I know I would probably cave in. But can you imagine if you had the capacity to create food by snapping your finger and you've been that hungry? Wouldn't you just want to just for a moment? But Jesus didn't. That's why Jesus can say, listen, I know what you're feeling, but I know because the Spirit of God lives in you, you have the ability to say yes and to say no to the things you say yes and no to. Which leads to the third thing in verses five through seven, and that is this. Jesus understands our struggle with pride. I think, well, Jesus never had pride. Nobody easily could have. I mean, just think about it. The enemy questions his ability and his power. This, this is the side where I don't fully understand how Jesus balances. Jesus is the creator of the universe. And one of his created beings, who's the devil, comes to him and says, yeah, I don't know if you have the ability to do this. He's baiting him. He's saying, ah, I don't think you, like, if you really could do this, and he's trying to get Jesus to respond and like, can you imagine just for a moment, Jesus going like, yeah, I am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to show you up right now, right? I would do it that way, wouldn't I? Like, I had the power. What is that? That's pride. And when pride in our ego gets injured, we respond and we do things that we don't think about and we just react in the moment. And usually that's when we get in trouble. Usually that's when we sin. Why? Because we're thinking out of pride and ego and insecurity. That's the internal motivation for that. And we respond. Why? Because we're going to show somebody that's not true. I'm going to stand up for myself. What is that? That's pride. And pride is one of the most destructive things in the human condition because it's the thing that many times motivates our sin because we're doing it out of our own ability, our own strength. Why? Because we don't want somebody to show us up. So here, let me give you a, a, an example. So you may not be a soccer fan, but if you are, you'll get it. If not, you'll get the idea. Zinedine Zidane is one of the greatest French soccer players of all time. Okay, And if you know soccer, you know him. But his last game they'd ever played in World Cup competition, which is the pinnacle of soccer, or as the rest of the world calls it, football, not what we're going to watch this afternoon, but real football, 
is that he had a moment where he let his pride drive him and it's the last thing that people remember of him on a soccer pitch. So take a look at this video and see if maybe you can relate. Five minutes later, the moment came. As Italy thwart an attack and clear their lines, Zidane jogs past Materazzi. Words are exchanged and then it happens. He's just headed Materazzi in the middle of the chest. What was Zidane thinking of? Zinedine Zidane's career ends with being sent off in the World Cup final. Zidane paid the price, and so too did his teammates. Oh, and he's hit the woodwork. Despite the drama, Matarazzi and the Italians kept their cool in the shootout. And it's Grosso. If he scores, Italy have won the World Cup. Perhaps the most iconic image of the 2006 World Cup isn't of the winning captain, Fabio Cannavaro, lifting the trophy, but of Zidane's lonely walk back past the trophy as he leaves the pitch. Zidane, the flawed genius with a final shocking chapter in his legacy, walked off never to play again. The end of a great footballing career marked by a moment of madness. Yeah, wow, if you're not a soccer fan, like I never saw that before. Can you imagine having an incredible career and the, the last thing that people remember you for is I love what the commentators is a moment of madness. How many moments of madness in our life? It happens all the time, we react and it's out of our pride. And Jesus says, I know what it is to feel like your pride's been injured. I know what it is to feel like you wanna react. I know what it is even to feel like you have the capacity to react and defend yourself, but I also know the victory when you don't respond in pride. That's what Jesus wants us to understand, which leads to the, the final thing of, of what he understands, and that is this. He understands our struggle with selfishness. He understands that. How does he understand that? Well, so the enemy does what? He takes him to, the, to a place where he can present. Somehow we know the enemy had the capacity to present all the kingdoms of the world. And he says to Jesus, all you have to do is just just bow down and worship me and I'll give them all to you. I'll, I'll, basically what he was providing for Jesus was a shortcut. Jesus knew what he was coming. Jesus was coming to suffer and to die for all of humanity and that was how he would find his way into ha having what, authority over all the kingdoms of the world. But the enemy came along and said, let me give you a shortcut. Let me make it easier on you. Just do this and it's all yours. Can you imagine if you knew what was in front of you? The worst suffering human beings can go through is what Jesus went through when he, not only before he got to the, 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 the season or the, the week we call Passion Week where he obviously was crucified and all that, but what he went through even as, as being betrayed by all of his friends, by all of his disciples to the point where he's left by himself and then he goes through all this physical abuse and then eventually he dies. All he went through, all that suffering, he knew he was gonna go through that. And in that moment, he could have said, yeah, I'll take the easy road. What if Jesus would have taken the easy road? None of us are here today. Because he wouldn't have accomplished the most important thing was what? Was to, to die on our behalf, to forgive us for sin, and to conquer death, which is the biggest issue for all of humanity. And he could only accomplish that if he took the road of suffering, if he took the road that was self-sacrificing. Ever been tempted to do something selfish in your life? Yes, every single day. That is the, that's the tension we live in internally, right? I know if I make this decision, it's gonna be best for me, but if I make this decision, it may be the worst for other people. We make that des those decisions every single day in a moment. And Jesus knows the temptation to be selfish, to do something for yourself only at ultimately the expense of other people. It's, it's, there's stories throughout the Bible where, where people are presented with this. One of the most famous, famous ones is back in the book of Joshua, with a man named Achan, and, and obviously Israel has, is advancing into the promised land. The first city they take is Jericho, and we all know the story of Jericho where the walls fell down, but part of the instructions given to Israel was there are certain things that they would take in the plunder that were only devoted to God, and they were not allowed to have them, but Achan saw something, and he, as you could tell in the story the way it's written, he's by himself, he sees some things that are valuable, he, they're devoted things, but he takes them for himself, he puts them in his tent, and he buries them, so nobody will find them. So then they go on to the next city, which is Ai, and in that first battle, I think 30 of his fellow soldiers die in a city smaller than Jericho, and they pull back, and Joshua is like ready to lose his mind as the leader of Israel at the time, trying to figure out, God, what do we do? And it turns out what the result was, because Achan's sin, 
God would not let Israel advance. So 30 people lose their life. That doesn't seem fair. But eventually, Achan gets exposed. And as the story goes, not only does Achan get judged, but his entire family. Thanks, Dad, right? Thanks for the support. Thanks for being such an upstanding guy. So his one sin costs the life of his family and his fellow soldiers. When in that moment, he was thinking, yeah, if I could just take this for my advantage, no one will ever know. I'll just set it aside and maybe I'll, I mean, think about it. He was taking jewels and, and he's taking like a cloak. When's he gonna wear it, right? Like, where did you get that? Oh, I just happened to find it, right? But he's doing something, thinking it's gonna advantage himself and what it's, it's a dis- disadvantage to everybody else. We all have made decisions in our life in a moment where we've only thought about ourselves. But Jesus, in the moment of temptation, gives you and I the capacity to see beyond our own needs in ourself. That's one thing that Jesus demonstrates when he's on the planet. The Father always supplies what he needs, always fulfills what he needs. The same thing's true for us today. So with that understanding, that Jesus understands all these things that we walk through, how do you and I navigate temptation? How does Jesus help us in our moment of temptation in understanding his humanity? The first thing is this. He provides the out. He always provides a way for us to not give in to the temptation. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul writes this in the, the we call this a paraphrase of the message. It says, no test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. Oh, he'll always be there to help you come through it. He's always present. Jesus doesn't abandon you and I in the moment of our temptation. He's actually present. He's tempted in every way, yet what? He's perfect because he didn't give in to it. So he always provides a way out. There was always a way out for him. There's always a way out for us. One of the primary temptations I've seen in the church is that when you and I go through a difficult time, we buy into a lie and we give into it. I'm better off by myself. Isolation. That's one of the lies the enemy tells us to do. And so, so it's not that you can tell this for sure, but I, I, I watch as a pastor and working with people, when people begin to disengage, they've already bought into a lie. They bought into a lie that I can navigate this on my own. I don't need to be around other people, especially if I fail, because I'm going to feel shame if I'm around them. So I can handle this on my own. And the enemy goes, yes, you can. And then you're stuck and then you're lost, and then you're disconnected, and then you're defeated over and over and over and over and over again. That's why God created this thing called the church. It's a community of people that, who are broken who still come together in relationship because we love each other and we support each other. And there's a huge difference between the Lone Ranger Christian who tries to do it on their own and somebody who makes the commitment to be in community, which I've discovered one of the primary avenues of the way out of temptation that God gives us is other people. And yet we think we can go on our own. We can't. And I haven't done a study, but I know a study has been done actually recently. A number of studies have been done that actually show that people who attend church and people who engage in small groups in whatever capacity in different churches are far better off than those who don't. There's a scientific study that has proven this fact. The Bible tells us this, science tells us this, and yet we still think we know better. Now, I know right now I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here, right? We're talking whoever's on live stream and their PJs at home, maybe they need this more than we do, right? But I want you to think about that for a moment in your life. Are you engaged in a relationship with other people? Because if you are and you can be vulnerable with them, then they'll know that you are being tempted and they can help you in your moment of temptation. I look back over the last 22 years of my life, I've been in some form of a small group ongoingly whether it be in a community group or a small group with just guys or with other pastors that I meet with, but I have had deeper relationships for the last 22 years. Have I been perfect for 22 years? No, but am I better off for those 22 years? Yes, (laughs) because there's a way out when you're around other people that you don't have to give in to temptation, which leads to the, the second way that Jesus helps us in our temptation. He provides the truth. So every time the enemy comes to Jesus, what, what is he doing? He's, he's baiting him with a lie. That's how the enemy always works. And what is Jesus' response? Even when the enemy comes along and he quotes scripture, isn't it crazy that the enemy could quote scripture? He knows what the Bible says, and so he quotes it, but Jesus corrects him. So every response that Jesus has to the lie of the enemy is the truth of God's word. That's how he responds over and over again. Why is this so important? Because the battle that you and I face every single day is based on deception. That's how it works. 
It started at the beginning of time. It started with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Everything's great. They're relating with God face to face like God created human beings to, to be. But God also gave Adam and Eve this capacity to make choices. And so what do Adam and Eve do? They give in to a lie. And here's the lie embedded in the temptation in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. The, the sa Satan says to one, like, if you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. What is the enemy selling Adam and Eve? You don't need God because you are him. That's the lie. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like that's the root of everything that you and I struggle with, is that this, this idea that you don't need God because you're good enough on your own to be your own God. That's the way culture survives. That's the way we look. What You can make yourself into what you want to be because you have everything you need. You don't need somebody greater than you. You have it all in yourself. And that's the lie. Obviously, we know that Eve took the fruit, Adam and Eve ate the fruit because what they bought into this and then comes the rude awakening that the deception they gave into was a lie that was not true. And now they were worse off than before. So God presents this truth for us that we have this capacity to, do, to, to understand what is the truth because you and I, when we make decisions based on a lie, it never turns out well. There's always disappointment. There's always failure that follows. And then we start to live in that lie. And what lies have you believed that you continue to live under today? What even things that you have, you have said yes to that are based in deception and you've walked them out and you failed and you still keep going back over and over and over again, hoping that this time it's going to be different. And it never is. Why? Because it's based on a lie because you haven't gotten to the truth of the scriptures and the truth of what God's spirit says about you and what's going on in the world. You haven't gotten to the truth yet. The only way you can ever overcome deception is through the truth, not your truth, not your own truth, but God's truth. Otherwise, you just keep going back. It's kind of kind of like when you're a kid. You know, this, this is the good and bad of being a kid. There's the innocence of childhood where you have this faith to believe that everything's true. Anybody, anybody remember that? And it's good, except when people exploit it. And in our world, people know how to exploit innocence. So here's the perfect example, okay? I'm scarred, and I'm still recovering from this. Anybody ever bought a box of cereal or got your parents when you were a kid because there was a toy inside? Okay, here's another confession. My downfall, Lucky Charms. So take a look at the screen. All right, anybody remember, like, old-school Lucky Charms? So, I mean, you're looking at these and thinking, okay, as a kid, when my, when my mom would let me go to the store with her, I would hound her on the cereal aisle. Kim mocks me today. When, when we go shopping, if I'm on the cereal aisle, she just leaves me there. <laughs> does She does. She goes, I'll meet you around the other aisle because she knows I'm going to get stuck. Just like, wow, look at all this sugar, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, look at, look at what you see on the screen. I mean, come on, who doesn't want, I, I like the, the middle one, a globe trotter whistle, <laughs> Right? I mean, the parents are like, oh, absolutely not. I'm not getting you a box of cereal, sugar, and a whistle, right? Or you need the Lucky Charms uh, skateboard racer, which is made out of paper, probably, or plastic. It's going to fall apart. Or if you're a Star Wars fan, they'll bait you on a Star Wars stuff, right? So you have this promise. And I remember as a kid, every single time my, I would convince my mom to buy a box of cereal and we get home, if you're like me, what do you do? You open the box, I pour all the cereal in a bowl, and I find the toy. Anybody relate? Okay, my mom just said, you can't stick your hands in there, okay, and dig for it. You got to pour it out, and then you can put it back in. And I would be so excited, and my excitement would last for about a minute because the toy would break, or it wouldn't be like it was shown on the box, or it wasn't promised, all these things. But it never, ever stopped me as a kid. Every single time I was at the store, I would look. If I saw a commercial on TV, oh, that box has this. Why? Because I believed it's going to be diff different this time. Why? And the whole thing was based on a lie, because they can't fix, fit any great toy that you're really going to want in a cereal box. <laughs> but as a kid, you believe they can, right? A whole bike fit in the cereal box, right? You think that in your mind. But as a kid, you believe that, but then it's exploited over and over and over again. What was the enemy doing to Adam and Eve? He was exploiting their belief and trust, which is what happens in our culture. So you have to understand that we live in a world based on deception. So before you and I make decisions, how does Jesus help us? We pause and we ask some questions and we ask God, is this true? 
Is this true with your word? Is this true with what your spirit's saying to me right now? Not just make a quick decision. And then we begin to hear the spirit of God over the spirit of this world, which is the enemy, who's trying to get us to buy a lie. And then we make, what, better decisions. Why? Because you won't give in to sin and temptation when you're basing your decisions based on what is true instead of what is a lie. And then the final thing is this. How does Jesus help me in my temptation? He provides the forgiveness. So he gives us this gift of the out and the truth, and this is what God is so good at. Even in our humanity, he knows. Even when we have a way out and the road is like obvious, this is the way to go, there's a neon sign saying go this way, this is the way of escape, and we still ignore it. And then he gives us the truth to dispel the lie and we see clearly and we ignore that. He says, I still love you enough that even when you give in to temptation, I'll forgive you for your sin. He'll make a way, even when we give in, even when we fail, even though he didn't fail, he didn't die for himself, he died for us because he knew that we would fail. This is what the Bible reminds us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, yeah, I saw the way out and I ignored it. I listened to the truth and I ignored it and I blew it. That's confession. And what does it say when we confess our sin? He's faithful. He's just. He'll forgive us. And he will make us right. So this is what's amazing, that Jesus covers every angle of our temptation, from the the beginning to the middle to even the end of failure, which what does forgiveness do? It always gives us another opportunity to do it right. So when we fail, we don't have to be stuck in that failure over and over and over again because forgiveness gives us the ability for God to break the cycle in our life. So I want to put it this way, the way that temptation works in our life, the way, why this is so important for the way that God works and how it unfolds. So let's say that you're on a hike and you're out in the mountains and you come to a, you know, it's like you see them in the movies all the time, a suspended bridge over a ravine. It's this old kind of rickety wooden bridge. It's got rope on the side and wood slats and, you know, you've seen those kind of things. And so you come and, and as you're walking up to that, the first thing that you see is you see a sign that says detour and it's pointing you away from the bridge. But something inside you says, nah, people have crossed that bridge before. I think I could do this. And so you're, 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 you're seeing the detour sign, but you're like, ah, detours, those are for people who are scared. I'm not afraid. I think I can make it across this. So you move past the detour sign to another sign. And the next sign says, danger. Do not enter. And so you've got a detour that says where to go. You've got danger, don't enter, which is the truth. And what happens is you're like, nah, you know what? Some of those boards are kind of rickety, but some of them look strong enough to hold my weight. I think I can make it across. And so you go past the detour sign, you go past the danger sign, and you start walking across the bridge. And the third step in, you step on a board and it breaks and you start falling. It's only then you think, ah, I should have taken the detour. I should have listened to the sign that said, danger, do not enter. Here's the beauty of the way God works in our life. As you're falling, suddenly a net catches you. And you don't fall into the ravine and die, but the net catches you. What is the net? It's called forgiveness. And it's what God has put in place for humanity that when we ask for it, when we confess our sin, when we blow it and we admit it, what does God do? He saves us from ourselves, even when we ignore all the warning signs. That is amazing that God would do that for us, that God would care deeply enough for us that even when we ignore him, even when we turn our back on him, even when we we rebel against him, even when we spit in his face, he still offers forgiveness for those who ask. That's the story of humanity. That's why it started back with Adam and Eve. It's it's our story today, that God is, is patiently waiting for people to wake up to see that their way is not the way that he had created for them to live. And so therefore, he offers forgiveness. Why? How can he offer forgiveness? Well, because he paid for our sin. He's the one that fell through the bridge and died on our behalf. So he creates the net to catch us when we do the same. That's the beauty of what, the truth of what temptation looks like. That when you do give in, it's not the end. It's not over. But here's what God asks of us. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come and join me. We're going to, we're going to close with a song. 
But I want us to understand something very important about the way God works. Because last week we talked about Jesus is a friend of sinners, which means that Jesus has the capacity to understand sinners in such a way that he can be close to them, he can be their friends, he can love them. Even though their lifestyle may be wrong, he can still be present with them, so eventually someday they'll understand his love. He's very personal. And then this week, I want us to understand this. I can't describe or understand or even fully appreciate maybe what your temptation looks like in your life. But I thought, no one thing's for sure from what we've read today, Jesus certainly does. He knows. He understands. He understands what the feelings and the emotions and what gets built into your life. And so today, one of the things that I believe that God wants for each one of us is to understand that he's giving us a way out. He's giving us the truth, but he also is offering forgiveness. He wants to transform our heart. He wants to change us. And the way that happens is when we realize that forgiveness means that God can change something that I've done. He can make right what I've done wrong in my life by his forgiveness. And the way that that comes about is when we surrender our heart fully to him. See, Jesus didn't come to be a distant God. He came to be the God who's present, the God who's personal, the God who is reestablishing the relationship that all of us have fractured or walked away from in our lives. The Bible calls it reconciliation. That when we came into this world, we came in with a default. The default was towards sin. And when we eventually sin, we break relationship with God. The good news is because what Jesus did, he reconnects us back to God through the cross, through his resurrection, which means that even though I'm human and broken and flawed, guess what? I can be reconnected back to God. And when you get reconnected back to God, guess what? You realize who you are. You realize what life's about. You realize what's going on in the world. You realize what your purpose is. Why? Because you're now connected back to the source you were created to be with. And that's through Jesus. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray, and the team's going to lead us in this song. But I'm going to ask you this morning, just with your eyes closed, would you go ahead and do that? That there's a point of response for each one of us, depending on where we're at in, in our understanding of who God is and in the journey that we're in. But the first one starts with the first step. And that is this. Jesus profoundly loves each person here today. And when he came into this world being fully God and being fully man at the same time, he knew the journey that his life would take him on and the perfection he would live in and not sinning yet being tempted, but also the suffering he would go through knowing that the only way to provide forgiveness for human beings was for him to take their place, for him to pay for their sin, for him to give his life for theirs and that means he did that for us today and he did that because he knew that we were estranged from God he knew that we were without hope and stuck away from God but wanted us to experience why we exist to be connected to God again if you're here today and you you've never you know of God but you've never experienced a personal connection with God God has always been some distant figure that you have to try to appease or you please in your life or he's some kind of person or, or God who kind of got things rolling, but he's really never really been personal. God wants you to know today that he is personal, and that's what all human history is about. God wanting to encounter every human heart, wanting to connect with every human being, but there comes a time where you and I have to make a decision, and here's the decision. The decision is to stop relying on ourself to navigate life, to stop doing what the lie that was originally given to Adam and Eve has become a part of our life, and that is to stop trying to be our own God and surrender to letting Jesus be God, letting him be Lord of our life. And if that's something you know that you want to do today, that you want to say yes to Jesus so that you can experience the fullness of his forgiveness that meets you at all those moments of temptation and failure and helps you to have a new start, then in, in a moment as I pray, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing because here's the good news, that Jesus knows your thoughts. He hears your words, and as you pray, he hears you. You're just going to pray and tell him, I want to surrender my life to you. And when you do that, the Bible tells us that he allows his spirit to come and to live inside of you, to help you to resist temptation, to help you to live the life he wants you to live. And then for those who have already made that commitment to Jesus, what is the moment of temptation that you face each day, each week, each month? Know today that Jesus is present right where you're at. Jesus is with you in the moment of temptation. And he's providing out of his grace and his love, he's providing the way out. And today for some, that way out is being in community with people. 
is no longer living an isolated life, is no longer living behind a curtain of shame that won't share the real person of who you are, the brokenness inside of you, and God is calling you out and asking you to have courage to engage in relationships so that you can find freedom in some of the areas of brokenness and temptation in your life. And for others, he's calling you today to experience his forgiveness. He's wanting you to know that, yeah, you have failed, and yes, you've fallen short of what I purpose for your life, but the good news is this, it's not over. There is forgiveness, there is hope that the next time you face that temptation, you don't have to go down the same road. You get to go down the road that Jesus would lead you down, which is the road of detour around to safety that doesn't allow you to fall into temptation. So Jesus, we thank you that you are present today. And Lord, in a moment, we're gonna sing about surrendering our whole heart to you. And Lord, wherever we're at in our journey in knowing you today, we are surrendering all of who we are because we know it is through your grace and your mercy that when we are captured by who you are, that we have the, the power to overcome temptation. But we also, Lord, we have your love and your grace and your mercy to enjoy what this is all about, to enjoy a relationship with you. So Lord Jesus, as we sing and as we pray this morning and we surrender to you, would you begin to work your deep work in our hearts and our souls that changes and transforms us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Because we're gonna sing this one last song together.